Welcome back. We're coming to the final <laughs> pages here of A Prophet for Today by Rabbi uh, Stephen Przansky. We're on chapter 9, The Division of the Land. The division of the land of Israel was the culmination of events dating back to the time of Avraham. It was one of the goals of the exodus from Egypt, the fulfillment of the fundamental covenant between Hashem and our forefathers. For all the land you see to you and to your descendants will I give it forever. The distribution of the essential, was the essential purpose of the book of Yehoshua. Rav Ada, the son of Rabbi Hanina, stated, if the Jewish people had not sinned, they would only have been given the five books of, of Torah and the book of Yehoshua. The latter, because it teaches the disposition, literally the arrangement of the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's as though it is a conclusion in some ways of the Torah, because the Torah's goal really is to get Torah at Sinai and then the land, okay. right? You know, it's the it's five cups of wine at Pesach. Mm -hmm. The fifth cup is about getting the land. Right? Uh, the Torah provided us with mitzvot, and the book of Yehoshua imparted to us the arrangements of the various plots of land among the tribes and the value of the land of Israel conceptually. What makes Israel unique and special? This, that's a Rashi. The other books of the prophets and the uh, Ketuvim, the writings, deal largely with sin, sinners, the aftermath of sin, the admonitions, warnings, threats, punishments, exhortations, and repentance. You know, it's noticeable in Yehoshua that we, we have an expression in English when we're talking about the prophets, right? And the prophets cried out against something. They warned that something would happen. Change your ways, right? That is not the major topic of the book of of Joshua, of Yehoshua, which is really about the entrance of the land, how one should behave in the land, conquest of the land, dealing with the neighbors, dealing with each other, the relationship between the tribes, the relationship between the land and the people. The other idea of about, you know, if you don't change your ways, this will happen, is a very central theme of the prophets. This one is different in many ways. Um, the allocations of the land occurred over the course of seven years and spans more than ten chapters of the book of Yoshua. And yet, the seven years of conquest and the seven years of distribution did not result in the acquisition of the entire land of Israel as promised in the Torah. <clears throat> the covenant with Abraham delineated the promised land as stretching from the river of Egypt, the Nile, to the great river of the Euphrates, Iraq. This was reiterated later in Moshe's time. Wherever you trod your feet, that land shall be yours, from the wilderness and the Lebanon, from the Euphrates until the Western Sea, the Mediterranean. Moshe was shall be your boundary. Yeah, that's from Devarim. Mm -hmm. The biblical borders of Israel, therefore, extend to modern-day Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Egypt. Mm -hmm. Truly disheartening news for some of those countries, some of which use this knowledge to ascribe nefarious intentions to the modern state of Israel. Nefarious? Evil intentions, secret and evil intentions. That is to say, Israel exists not to be where it is, but really to conquer the whole Middle East. Mm -hmm. They need not fear. The Tuvot Haaretz comments that Israel's extended borders, as the Torah prescribes, will only apply when the Jewish people are so numerous that the land of Israel between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea is not large enough to contain them. Good, good comfort for them. That has never happened, neither in Yehoshua's time nor in any subsequent era. It has always been unnecessary to conquer land that far east, and it still remains unnecessary. Israel today, in its natural borders from Lebanon to the Sinai uh, and from the river to the sea, can more than accommodate all the, all the Jews in the world. 
Thus the Torah may set aside that land as far as the Euphrates and the river of Egypt for the Jewish settlement. But it is uncertain whether that expanse of Eretz Yisrael will ever be a national requirement. Yeah. It's an interesting... Uh, yes? What? He's a religious Jew. Say again? He's a religious Jew. How yeah. come would you really relate one mitzvah you accept from Torah? Like this, like, you know... And this is like... Nah. Well, it seems that Yehoshua was conquering a specific piece of land, right? Not the land that Avraham had come from, Iraq. You know, that he, you know, the, it was the land that Avraham lived in and saw, I would argue. Um, but it was said to Moshe as well, wherever you trod your uh, food? Yeah, yeah, also. Did Moshe was there? What? Did Moshe in Iraq? No, no. Well, you know, he went to Italy to get an Esrach. No, well, you know. Calabria. No, we have no. But why it says that. if he maybe it's where Moshe went and Moshe didn't go. There. No, but it describes it as being from Lebanon to the. It's, it's to the like sea. Arabs. What? Like Arabs. The moment they put foot on some kind in some country, that's ours. No, the difference here is that we're not saying it's ours. We're saying that this was promised under circumstances, certain circumstances to be for us, right? But we don't. Nobody claims that, right? There's an idea that that might, you know, for instance, what happens if um, we're allied unto the nations and those nations decide to convert, mm -hmm. right? For whatever reason, you know, the Kuzari, mm -hmm. right? If those nations choose to convert, and the consequence of it is that Israel grows in a way that was not able to be anticipated, right? Uh, then you might say, gee, all the land that is Iraq will become Israel because all the people living in Iraq have chosen to become Jewish. Right? You know, but we're not looking at that as a real possibility or a real concern. And when people throw that up and say, "Well, that's what the Jews are really planning," right? There's no evidence of it in any of our history. In any of our history. Right? Yeah, but some some Shvatim they got a piece of land on another side of Jordan. The, that's right, the, in Transjordan. Yes. The, there, but Transjordan was initially promised to the Jews internationally as well, and then it was subdivided and subdivided and subdivided. We ended up what we have. Transjordan was part, yeah. you know... Of San Remo or...? What? It was all part of the same um, province of the, Adam, of the Ottoman Empire as well, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and Jews lived, you know, on both sides of the Jordan, you know, for a long time. Um, and so that you can't compare that issue with. No, no, I, I just I, I don't know. I don't agree with it. With this part of with Syria which? and Lebanon is going to be ours because maybe they are, are going to convert. No. What about United States? Let's say the the entire United States uh, is going to convert. Why not to just take the part of Israel? Because it's not connected physically to Israel. Okay, let's connect right. something. What we can connect? Uh, uh, well, Egypt. Africa. Let's let's connect Egypt. <laughs> To the Nile, only to the Nile. <laughs> yeah, but listen, they decided. So, you know, we're we're talking about something that not only does not exist today, and not but has Lebanon, but has just part of Lebanon, but, but has never existed, right? And we've we've had possession of the land before. This is our third possession of the land, right? Nobody ever viewed it as beyond the initial possession. Maybe we right. did view it, it just it wasn't it was time. No, it wasn't time yet. As it's a, it's a, it's it's a very... It's exactly like uh, the Yatamitim, okay. It will happen, not now, but it will happen. I have to say, it's a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very complicated issue because then it raises the question of wars of conquest versus uh, independent wars in terms of how we deal with that process. It seems that nobody considers it, to the best of my knowledge, 
that that is a part of the heritage of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. That it is a promise. Other promises are made too of smaller areas, right? It's not always the promise of the greater Israel that is made, right? You know, the land that Abraham tread on, right, was the Israel that we know. The land that the spies investigated so why was the land that we know. The, yeah, this is your land too. Uh, it's, I don't know the answer to that question. You know, Goshen what, is what, ours because, and Goshen, Goshen goes, was deeded by the Egyptians to Goshen Sarah. Goshen goes till Nile. Right. I'm not sure exactly what the, what, what Goshen is. I, I don't, I'm not sure. Goshen is on the east side of the Nile, I think. Um, can you give me the, the brown book up there? Uh, you're, you're pointing to it. No, the other way. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, Keep, this, that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, next yeah, one. Yeah, next. Yes, that one. Yeah. You can look it up. Um, there you go. Eretz Israel, right. Goshen. Where's Gaza? Up north of it, huh? Gaza here. Yeah, okay. 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 Eretz Israel, here. Eretz Goshen, here. Mm, Nile. Mm-hmm. Going to from. Going yeah, to the Nile, to the Nile the Delta. Delta. Mm-hmm. It means included. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to continue. Mm-hmm. That's okay. All right. So we understand that this promise is one that has has not existed to date, and there's a view in the Gemara that this would only happen under very unusual conditions. Uh, of a tr- sudden and tremendous expansion of the population of Israel way beyond uh, what is imaginable at this time. So it might be a miraculous uh, process. Nobody in Cairo has to sleep over this right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, how is the land of Israel distributed? What was the method? And how were the tribes all satisfied, such as they were, with their allotments? The Navi, Yehoshua, recorded Hashem's directive to Yehoshua. So now divide this land as a heritage for the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. It says, 13.7 of of Sefer Yehoshua. Reuven Gad and the other half of Manasseh had already in Moshe's time received their portion on the eastern bank of the Ardain, which was now confirmed by Yehoshua. Remember, they've been 14 years away from home at this point. Mm -hmm. So if they have children that were born as they left, they're already bar mitzvah and young men, and have never met their fathers. Um, Even then, not all the Jews chose to, uh, sorry, uh, Reuben, Gad, and the other half of Menashe had already in Moshe's time received their portion on the eastern bank of the Jordan, which was now confirmed by Yehoshua. Even then, not all the Jews chose to enter and dwell in the land of Israel, a situation that would recur during the Second Temple era and again in modern times. <clears throat> Yehoshua's task and that of subsequent leaders down to our day was to maintain a connection and a fidelity to the diaspora Jews to the homeland. He accomplished this, Yehoshua accomplished this, by acknowledging their contributions to the conquest of the land and by emphasizing the primacy of Torah, which obligates all Jews. Thus, when those tribes built their own altar, that two and a half tribes built their own altar on the other side of the Yardane, when those tribes built their own altar in the Transjordan, the tribes of Israel perceived this as a Casus belli, a reason for war. Right? With them? Yeah. They were starting to, what uh, Vodazara is the way it was perceived. They're building an altar outside of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem huh? wasn't yet, they didn't have a temple yet. 
they had a Mishkan. It was in Shiloh. It was, you know, we know it moved around, right? But it was in Shiloh longer than it was uh, stood originally in the base of English. Um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 it was out of Mishkan, not because it was out of Jerusalem, because they created their own uh, sacri- given sacrifice in their own place. Instead they didn't do that. They what didn't do that. They built an altar. And so the, and it was a, a duplicate altar to the way it was built in the, um, in the Mishkan and later uh, in the temple. Um, thus when the tribes built their own altar in the Transjordan, the tribes of the land of Israel perceived this as a, as a reason for war and mobilized for war. The war was averted only when the tribes of Transjordan explained that they feared the people of Israel would eventually reject them as outsiders who have no share in the Jewish people. And deconsecrated, then they deconsecrated their altar and reaffirmed their allegiance to the people in the land of Israel. How do you deconsecrate the altar? They, the, as I understand it, they didn't actually use the altar. Right? They prepared it. They claimed that it was to keep a memory and a connection to the altar in Jerusalem, but that it wasn't to replace it at all. Mm-hmm. But the mutual uneasiness remained, and the ties did eventually fray. The tribes in Trans- Transjordan would be the first tribes to suffer the fate of exile as the first temple era neared its conclusion. Today's relationship between the Jews of the diaspora and the state of Israel, an unequal partnership of unclear parameters, essentially repeats the pattern of ancient times. Only one tribe would be omitted from the distribution. Who would that be? Levi. Right. But to the tribe of Levi, Moshe gave no heritage. Hashem's, Hashem, Lord of Israel, is their heritage, as he has spoken to them. It's a, it's a very interesting thing just politically, if you think for a moment, right? Here they are making a division. The tribe, the, which is the tribe of the, of the priestly class, right? in some ways separated and more important than all the others and the tribe of Moshe himself is the only one that's denied owning property not Moshe, oh, Levi, right. Levi. Mm-hmm. Levi. Mm-hmm. they don't need property mm-hmm. they don't need property is well, the way we, the way we Israel is going to feed them and to give them mm-hmm. money and to give them everything we're what going to come it? to that in a second so, so we perceive it right, as they don't need property right because God is their portion. But, it, you know, that generally is not true in the perception of most other religious orders. You know, the greatest landholder in the time of Henry VIII in England was the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. When he created the Anglican Church, it added tremendous wealth to the crown mm-hmm. at that point. And we see it in virtually every religion. That, you know, there's a tremendous amount of wealth that's built by the priestly class. Um, one tribe was omitted from the distribution, uh, but to the tribe of Levi, Moshe gave no heritage. Hashem, Lord of Israel, is their heritage, as he has spoken to them. That's a quote from... Uh, oh, that's actually from Yehoshua. The Levim were denied a physical heritage in the land of Israel and exempted from public military service, quote, because they were to set apart to serve God and teach his upright ways and righteous laws to the masses. Thus, as, as some Jews did not dwell in the land of Israel, others who dwelled in the land of Israel fo- focused exclusively on divine service and did not fully participate in the mundane aspects of life. Both phenomena exist today as well and remain a source of great controversy and debate. With all due respect to Rabbi Przansky, I have a problem with the statement. Mm-hmm. I think that he is somehow uh, bringing the Levium and the uh, Kolalim mm-hmm. uh, okay. of today on the same plane. In one case, a certain group is specifically set aside, denied material ownership, right? required to be dependent on the others, has no choice about mm-hmm. this, and has a full-time national service. Yeah. We should be very clear with this, right? 
They run the cities of refuge. They are dealing with the people who are responsible for manslaughter. Uh, they are responsible for guarding the base of Migdash. Um, they res they have tremendous yeah, amount the included. of their living as well. Yeah. Right? That they're all that they have very specific and arduous duties all year long. Some of them in the temple, some of them outside of the temple, and it's not a choice. Right? And uh, to you know to now I understand that Rambam says if you have a certain kind of psycholo psychology and behavior, you are like a lady. You're not really a lady, though, at that point, because you can own property and you don't have to do those things you're choosing to. Uh, the living don't have a choice in this matter. Uh, so I think that to compare those two, there are so many inconsistencies with that comparison uh, that I don't think it's a, a very strong one, personally. And I think uh, it says the first <clears throat> thing, comparing diaspora now with... Um, uh, you know, tribe who didn't enter. I don't think it's. Just, well, first of all, they did enter and they fought the war at the head of the why tribes. Is he what? Why is he? I think he's trying. You know, throughout this book, he's trying to bring similarities from the past to the present. I think this is a stretch in both cases. Yeah. You know, I, you know, we know that there are many very courageous people. Right. This is a plug from my movie. Mm -hmm. Promises to keep who did not live their lives in Israel, but after the Second World War, they put away their allied uniforms and uh, put on uh, Palmach uniforms and Irgun uniforms, or not uniforms, uh, and fought for the liberation of Israel uh, at that time. But that is not the two and a half tribes. You know, that's a very small group of people. They were important, but very small group. The majority of Jews after, who were not in Israel did not go to Israel to fight and then leave, as the tribes did. So I think in both of these comparisons, he's stretching it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the method of allotment had already been pronounced by Hashem to, to Moshe. To these shall the land be divided as an inheritance according to the number of names. And for the numerous one, you shall increase its inheritance, and for the lesser one, you shall decrease its inheritance. Each one, according to his count, shall his inheritance be given. Only by lottery shall the land be divided. According to the names of their fathers, tribes shall they inherit. According to the lottery shall one's inheritance be divided between the numerous and the few. The Torah states unequivocally that the lottery, the goral, would determine the distribution. Chazal maintained that an additional method was employed, the Urim Viturim. But how is it possible to assert that the Urim Viturim were used when the Torah states clearly that a lottery was used? In the words of the Rosh Bam, if you have an Urim Viturim, why do you need the lottery? And if you have the lottery, why use the Urim Viturim? Perhaps they might, have, they might contradict each other. The Gemara explains the process. Eleazar, the Kohen Gadol, wore the Urim Viturim, and Yehoshua and all of Israel stood before him, along with two containers of cards. One container held the names of the tribes, and the other contained the names of various territories to be dispensed among the tribes. Yehoshua would divide, uh, sorry, Yehoshua would divine inspiration. He was a prophet. Would pronounce, for example, Zevulun ascend. The Urim Viturim would then spell out Zavulin's name, and the Urim Viturim would then flash, Akko region. This was done for every tribe respectively. Then after the prophecy of the Urim Viturim, each tribal leader would reach into the container and shuffle the cards and astoundingly pull out the name of his own tribe. Say Zavulin would reach into the other box and shuffle those cards and amazingly extract Akko region card. The process was then repeated for each tribe. In effect, the selection and distribution was ratified twice before the eyes of the entire nation, once through the Urim Viturim and once through the lottery. So grievances would be impossible or at least minimized. People witnessed the hand of Hashem in the apportionment of the land of Israel. With this, Rashbam writes, Israel was satisfied with the outcome. Yes. But who divided the land? 
each each tribal section to, to the family section to put section on the piece of paper somebody has to sit and to say okay yeah. let's cut the map this this and this and this and this part uh, will go to whatever whichever is going to be who did this and some uh, pieces of land we know they're smaller than another yeah, so I, I think so, that... But who, and who land was scouted? Did, did, was it the time that the, they knew the whole Israel? Yeah. They, what, yeah. Went everywhere. they hadn't conquered yeah. all of Israel, but they knew all of Israel. Mm -hmm. They still were, were, were still fighting at this point, actually. Mm -hmm. But it, no longer was it a national fight. Each tribe was fighting mm -hmm. with the uh, foreigners within their borders, so to speak, at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, this was the responsibility in the end of Yehoshua to uh, divide the, the sections. Uh, who he got did, each section? He, just, he divided yeah. the. Yeah. Yes. So why uh, just not divide like uh, countries just squares? Like well, well, first of all, you, you couldn't divide it uh, because of the numbers of the tribes, the numbers of the population of each tribe. Some were much bigger than others, so you had to have bigger sections. Right? Even if you said there are 12 sections, or 11 sections, right? And actually, nine, nine and a half sections, right? Even if you said that's what it has to be, right? You would have to determine, right, where the borders of the section were based on the size of the tribe. Okay, but now, now comes another question. All 12 tribes, they, they lived in Eretz Israel. What we know today. Well, and the Transjordan. Yeah, what we know today. Not Eretz so Israel what, that we know today, Eretz Israel and Jordan. Yeah. So why Lebanon? Why Goshen? In the Torah that it belongs to us. Why all this. Uh, 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 they this were not part of the lottery. They weren't part of the lottery, that's right. So. Well, first of all, they, you know, Goshen was under the authority of, of Pharaoh at that point. A lot was under, I think it was Egyptian at that point, by the way. Okay, right? but uh, right. to whom it's going to be belong after Mashiach will come? I don't know. And the same with Transjordan, the same with uh, uh, Lebanon and Syria. No, Transjordan, see, Transjordan is actually different from this conversation. Yeah, okay, right? leave it. But because uh, it's the two and a half tribes. Yeah, but Lebanon and Syria in Iraq. <laughs> We're coming back to that conversation. Obviously, it was not part of the distribution. It was never part of the distribution. Maybe it's going I mean, to be different. I maybe. think the understanding was that, the, you know, if that time is to come, that time will come. You know, it's not now. You know, and we have no indication of it today. Okay. Um... Sorry, I'm just going to place. Okay. The Urim or Vitorum, per se, would not have been sufficient uh, to assuage the people's concerns because, as noted, there was an element of arbitrariness in their interpretation. The interpreter who asked the question had to arrange the revealed letters in an order that cogently answered the question. But the reply was not disclosed in a way that the average person was able to read and understand it. Because right? it was a flash, the flashing stones, right? And each of the stones had more than one letter on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, today there are some cell phones where if you want the letter C, you have to press it three times. The first time you press it, you get A. Mm -hmm. Second time you press it, you get B. And the third time you get C, mm -hmm. right? So when the Ur of Eternal was lighting up with the stone that had A, B, and C on it, you had to know by the context of all the other things that were lighting up, in what order, what what this was, right? So it was an interpretive thing, and it's possible that another tribe could have interpreted differently what than the way <coughs> the Kohen Gadol interpreted it, and consequently might have made an argument. But the reply was not disclosed in a way that the average person was able to read and understand it. Conversely, if the only method of distribution was the lottery, a random drawing, aggrieved parties, uh, those awarded the Negev Desert as opposed to the Sharon Valley, 
uh, would never would never be dissuaded that the results were fixed and prearranged by Yehoshua. This dual system, orchestrated by Ruach HaKodesh and the Divine Spirit, convinced the people that the results were precisely ordained by heaven. Because the very question that was asked earlier by the Rosh Bam was, this could lead to terrible trouble, right, if in fact there was a conflict between the Urim Vitturim and, and the Goral, right? What he didn't say was, if there's no conflict, everybody will accept, gee, this is not something that could happen coincidentally or be fixed. This is the way God wants it to be, and that is how it worked out. The real issue that concerned the people, as was predictable, was the relative size and value of each tract of land. The parcels were not divided equally, but according to the, a divine formula of which Yehoshua had preside, presided. The commentators differ on the basic question of whether there was any attempt to uh, add equality in the division of the land. Rashi, for example, maintained that the more numerous tribes received larger tracts of territory and consequently there was not an equal division of land amongst the tribes. Yet, each individual Jew within each tribe, except for the firstborn, received an equal portion of land. So by definition, the more populous tribes required more territory. Rambam disagreed and contended that the land of Israel was divided into 12 equal portions and that each tribe received the equivalent amount of land. The subdivision of that land within each tribe, however, differed in size and with, an indi with the individual members of a more populous tribe receiving less land than individual members of a less populous <coughs> land. So let's say, just for argument's sake, each... Um, what Rashi is saying is if you had... Uh, 1,200 units of land, uh, would each tribe get 100 units? Rambam says it would get exactly 100 units, right? And so if you had 200 members of your tribe, they would each get half a unit. And if you had 50 members of your tribe, they would each get two units. Mm -hmm. We're following this? Yeah. Right? That's clear, right? Yeah. Okay call it fair or not fair, it would be fair in the sense that each tribe got an equal piece of land. Mm -hmm. It would not be fair in terms of how, what each family got. Mm -hmm. That would be where it would not be fair. Right? On the other hand, says Rashi, there was a divine inspiration that varied the size of each territory relative to the size of each tribe. Mm -hmm. So going back to our formula before, right? if your tribe had 200 members, right? You would actually get twice, your tribe would get twice as much land as the person who had 100 members yes. to, to his territory, right? But each family within your tribe would have the same amount of land as each family within the smaller tribe. Right? So this is an argument right now between Rashi and Rambam, mm -hmm. okay? I think most people, well, let's see what it says. Um, the subdivision of that land within each tribe, however, differed in size with an individual member of a more populous tribe receiving less than uh, the individual member of a less popular side. This is Rambam's process. These two opinions reflect the two sides of the dispute brought down in the Gemara of Vavabatra. Was the land divided according to the number of tribes, 12 equal shares, or according to the number of heads of families, equal shares per capita? Strangely, the Gemara concludes that the land was divided equally among the tribes, the opinion of Rambam. How then can Rashi maintain that the, that the equality was for each individual beneficiary and not for each tribe? Several res resolutions are possible. Certainly, quantity is not the only method of measuring equality. Remember, we talked about the Negev Desert versus the Sharon Valley. You could have twice as much territory in, in the Negev Desert and still be able to grow fewer crops. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not the, the necessarily the only way of measuring equality in Israel. Especially in Israel, for anybody who's been there, we know, one must account for the varying quality of the land and the climate. As the Gomorrah Bhavabhatra states, one say of land in Yehuda is worth five in the Galil. Right? Really? 
That's what it's saying. Uh, the equitable distribution of land had to account for the qualitative differences as well. Uh, Israel is unique, perhaps in the world, in the variety of topographies and climates. It presents mountains and valleys, fertile plains and deserts, lush pastures and barren canyons, and all in a geographically small area. A person, if he chose, could ski and swim on the same day in regions that are relatively close to each other. Perhaps then the equality of the land, because from Mount Hermon to a lot is how long a drive? Anybody know? Seven hours? Six hours. Six hours. By bullet train, it'll probably be cut down to two hours no, when the time comes. Minutes. From a lot to... Seven or nine. Not to Mount Hermon. Tel Aviv to a lot. Tel Aviv to a lot. Yeah. So, in any case, it's, a, you know, it's the size of New Jersey. We know this, right? Uh, but it has the climate variables, really, of the entire uh, North America, in a sense. Uh, North and South America, for that matter, because it has tropical climates too. Um, so these these elements had to be taken into account as well. Uh, perhaps then the equality of the land for each individual recipient was measured not in size but in value, dependent on objective factors, fertility of the land, um, and subjective factors, aspirations and interests of a particular tribe. The Malbim adopted the contrasting view of the Ravat, that the Urvaturim and the lottery allocated to the tribes provinces of varying dimensions and attributes. Yehoshua then, with the tribal heads, made territorial adjustments uh, in order to accommodate the needs of the individual tribes and the needs of each recipient family within each tribe. This was done through negotiation, not divine inspiration. 